Good morning. Hello. How are you from a somewhat wet East Kent? Oh, was this the right decision? Right turn. We're going to find out, aren't we? I saw somebody turn right there and it didn't look like... Oh, then no, no, there's more traffic. Oh, I've obviously made the wrong decision here. Disaster. We're going full tilt with putting a lab in at work. We managed to uh, hook up the plaster machine grinder now. So all I need is uh, some, uh, the next step is to learn how to do additions and uh, repairs. So is this the future for acrylic micro labs on site? We had a look at uh, uh, Denture injection molding techniques. Um, Ivor Clark do one in particular. Um, I can. The problem is that you know it's quite obvious that the idea of micro labs hasn't occurred to them yet. So really, it's like uh, you know if you've got a big lab, the commercial lab, and you want to do injection molded dentures, and, uh, spend a load of money on our materials and, and help us make a profit, then. This is the technique, this is, this is our procedure for you. Um, however, it's too complicated at the moment for a micro lab. It's, honestly, it's, it's too complicated. So, I mean, I dare say, you know, once you did it a couple of times, it would get a lot simpler, but just looking at it, I'm thinking, it's going to take me or someone most of a morning to uh, set that all up, cast it all up, put all the injection moulding things in, and then that's assuming it all goes perfectly. You know, I mean, you might find that it it doesn't. So you're going to have some processing errors. If you have a processing error and you've already done your setup and done your trying and got it all perfect, then you're in trouble, aren't you? So it looks like, and this is all because our denture next door is uh, changing and they're going to work for border force on the grounds that the, you know, the, the rather annoying grounds that border force uh, terms and conditions and pay are better. I mean, who would have thought it? So I might, I might insert some pictures of our new lab just so you can see how it's getting along. We still need to have a sink put in and a few little bits and bobs, but I think we'll be okay. Now, how is it going to impact uh, patients who need dentures? Well, in, it's gonna be negatives and also positives. So, negatives, for example, are that uh, we're gonna be handled off far fewer dentures. You know, if I get 10 people in and uh, and I say, and 10 people need dentures, and I can take 10 first impressions and send them all next door, and it's a technician who has to stay up till midnight, isn't it, not me, doing it all. Um, so we're gonna have to be a bit more selective about who we make dentures for, or more likely we're gonna have to possibly put the price up for dentures uh, to deter people, um, which you'd never like to do, you know, but, because more of it's going to be done in house. Now you might think, well, that's going to make it more expensive because you've got a dentist doing it instead of a technician. But this is where the positive sides come in because um, I would say 50% of the time I'm having to remake or, or, or uh, substantially uh, re-engineer something that's been done because it's not been done to the sort of standard that we we would we need and my definition of private work is the best work that you can do um, and I'm not saying that the technicians that's the technician uses a different standard but uh, what, what we found and this is what we found in the mixed economy 
is that by mixed I mean NHS and private trying to work side by side you know is that these things do not rub along well together at all you know you've got some smelly NHS patient and I mean I mean quite literally smelly covered in dog hair stinking the waiting room out and alongside there's you know Elder Bucket saying I don't want to sit in a waiting room with with a bunch of horrible uh, people who never brush their teeth and have only come because they've got a swelling so you know how do you do that I mean two waiting rooms different times for the patients you know they're just private patients are not stupid they can sort of sense when you're not really private what they want is a, is a private dentist um, it's the reason why I don't travel on buses because the last time I had to travel on a bus which was a rail replacement service I was stuck next to a bloke who couldn't stop farting and you know, amongst a load of people who didn't care that he was farting all the time because they travel on the bus all the time and that's what you put up with if you travel on a bus and I'm like well I don't, I don't I'm not the sort of person that travels on a bus in that case so <clears throat> The patients know, for example, if you do mostly National Health Service, but you um, do the same sort of more or less level of service, and but charge more and call it private, uh, because but and they're basically dentists do this because they think they deserve more. They think they should they should be able to charge more for what they do. So what they do is they carry on doing more or less the same work, but treating the contribution from the private patients as a sort of a voluntary uh, tip, bonus. Whereas in fact it's not. You know, private patients pay more in return for three things, which is more time, uh, better quality materials and better quality laboratory work. And it's got to the point now, I think, with, with a lot of labs, especially the smaller independent labs, that they are so, so inundated with NHS work, especially in March. March is the month where they're up to their eyeballs in mouth guards because mouth guards get the maximum number of points under the three bears porridge scheme and uh, are easy to do. And a dentist can say to a patient, you know, I think you need a mouth guard. Um, and the patient will say, well, all right then, and then just, you know, possibly just throw it away because most of the time they're exempt. So it doesn't really cost them anything uh, to just say yes, have a mould done and then throw it away. And every one of those costs the NHS 300 quid. So if your technician is for the most part working on the NHS, but just doing your work privately, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how much he says to you, yes, well, you're, I do your work separately. Or, I mean, our, our technician, he used to prioritise our work. That was true. I mean, if I came round and I said to him, I've got a patient who's, you know, uh, needs a denture urgently because they live in France. Can you can you get me some special uh, trays or uh, a try and done a couple of tryings done in a week? He will. He would do that. He would prioritise our work because he was is charging us top dollar, um, and everybody else used to wait. And it used to be a week in between uh, visits for NHS patients, and now it's deteriorated to the point where he just says, uh, you can have the work back when I've done it, you know, I'll just let you have it. If it's a week or two weeks, then... But the NHS has reacted to that, you know. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And the reaction to that has been the dentist uh, taking impressions of the patient's mouths and saying, can you make me a denture? Can you take this straight to fit? What well, they call straight to fit. So we are now going impression straight to fit and on the NHS. And the way they do it is that they take an impression and then the denture comes back and of course the teeth are not, you know, they're not where they really should be, but they're more or less right because the technicians more or less can guess where the teeth should be. And, um, and then, and then they just grind the hell out of the denture to make it fit. They just put it in and then they just literally just start hacking it away until there's some sort of approximation of a bite. And then they say to the patient, there we go, 
there's your NHS denture. So this is, you know, and when I qualified, I never dreamed I would hear about this sort of quality of work. But my point is it has a knock-on effect on uh, my work in that, you know, if I take a primary impression and, for example, I, it's not fully extended on the palette. Now, what I would expect was the technician, if I asked him for a special tray, to make, for him to make me a special tray that was fully extended on the palette by removing the plaster, and I don't care about even guessing where the palette is, for example, because I want him to help me do a better second impression that is, is fully extended on the palette because obviously we've got some problem with taking the impression on that patient as regards palatal extension and so by fully extending the second impression he can help me, you know, over, over a technical problem. <coughs> now it's no use to me if I get a special tray back which basically mirrors the surface that I've already impressed without the palette, because although I'll probably get a more accurate impression of the bit that I've already done, I want a more fully extended impression. However, it's more work for him to, uh, you know, extend the special tray. Or I think, more likely, it's not incumbent upon him, it's not, uh, he doesn't consider each case to the point where he might work out that a, a special tray needs to be extended over the pallet on that particular case. And that is just one example of a number of things, you know, that um, we've got to a situation now where the technicians are being very, uh, they're concentrating very much on just flinging the work out the door and saying, well, I'll you know, the dentist has given me poor quality work and so I don't feel so bad about sending back crap to be, you know, quite blunt. If he's sending me crap and, and, and I'm sending him crap, then who's the worst of the two of us? And also, I think they, uh, they think they have the, intellect, the, the moral high ground, the technicians, because they think, well, if you're going to send me crap, then you can sort it out in the surgery when you get the work back, you know. If you send me uh, uh, an impression straight to fit and you don't send me the bite or an opposing model and the bite's completely wrong, then that's your lookout, you know. When you get back to the surgery, you can sort it out. But the problem is it extends to the bite blocks too and things like that, you know, the special trays, as I've said. You know, you'll get bite blocks back that are Not where no serious thought has been put into what uh, is the likely buy. And technicians send back buy blocks which are slightly too big on the grounds that you can just smush them up and get the patient to buy into them and then they, they will record the buy. Whereas in fact my idea is to have the bite box as closely approximating where you're going to put the teeth as possible and if necessary, you can do a squash bite or a, a blue moose bite to to get the bite. So I'd rather that I'd rather they were slightly undersized. It's a bit like crowns, you know. It's it's <clears throat> if a crown is slightly too high on the bite, then that's a big problem. If a crown is slightly too low on the bite, then that's no problem at all, you know. <coughs> so you you need to err on being slightly too low. And just slinging a load of wax on a on a cast and you, and putting a couple of blocks on is just not you know without any appreciation of what's class one, what's class two, division one and two, or class three. And uh, we you know we are getting bite blocks back where you can you can practically articulate the uh, the the casts without even a bite block. But we want a bite block because there is some, some small degree of, you know. Like for example, I had a patient in with a class two division one occlusion, quite V-shaped anterior arch. Had all her upper front teeth and all her lower front teeth. Now, no, not many back teeth, but you know that if you've got a patient like that, you can 
they'll have a very deep overbite, you know, to the extent that even the lower incisors might be stripping the palatal gingery off the, um, there goes my tool kit, off of the upper, uh, the, the inside incisors. But, so you can locate this bite together very accurately at the front, both in terms of the overbite and the uh, AP nature of the uh, jaws but probably there's a bit of uh, variety in terms of how much she's open at the back. So obviously we need some bite blocks just to uh, consolidate that, to, to codify that. But you can, you can pretty much make these blocks to within a millimetre of where they need to be because you know more or less, you know, uh, how, how she bites. But, but you don't get that. You just get these massive bite blocks at the back. <laughs> So, which is a long way round of bringing me back to my original point, which is the pluses of having a micro lab. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, people have said to me, well, won't you be uh, fed up spending 15 minutes making bite blocks? Um, and first of all, I think I've got a technician, I've got a, I've got a nurse who I think would make a very good technician. And I think she's, uh, you know, ready for that uh, challenge. And uh, so it wouldn't be me that would be doing them anyway. And the other thing is that, you know, I make the sodding bio blocks anyway. I have to make them out of what he sends me back. The only difference is I have to make them in a, <coughs> I have to make them in the surgery out of tools which are not dental laboratory tools, you know. I have to I have to make them on an ad hoc basis in the in the actual surgery. So I, I have to knock up some decent bio blocks anyway. You know, it just gives me the starting point. I have to finish them off. So surely it's going to be to my benefit to be manufacturing these things myself, because to be honest, they're, they're going to end up pretty well perfect straight away, aren't they? Because I'll have oh, I already seen the patient, I've got the benefit of seeing the patient. I know the occlusion, I know how thick I want them, I know where I want them, I can I can pretty much guess the bite. And so it's going to lead to a massive, uh, you know, there'll be a big imp uh, increase in lab time, but m much less uh, surgery time for me in front of the patient. Um, especially since we've got these six, uh, six articulators that we're going to, you know, that we use to set the work up. So I'll be able to um, set the work up. Um, pretty much straight away now, especially we've simply got the plaster grinder. So we are, I've had a chat with my lab, regional lab, who is still going, and they do do denture work. And I've said to them that, you know, my problem is uh, at the moment I can do a crown. The crown takes two weeks. I post it off and... Um, I get the crown back two weeks later. So all that does is it gives me the problem of having to do a temporary crown for two weeks. But that's not really a, an issue. You know, our crowns have always taken two weeks since the 1980s when I qualified. Um, but I can't do a denture if every stage of a denture is gonna take two weeks. So we're gonna to have to do a lot more of it in house. So we've been thinking long and hard about what we can do in our micro lab. So obviously we can take impressions. We can cast the impressions. We can make bite box, we can articulate the, uh, we can make special trays, we can take second impressions, cast those, articulate those. Then it's a question of the uh, setup. Now, um, <clears throat> we are, I've got an opportunity here to make a step up in terms of quality in that instead of every set of dentures having exactly the same tooth on it, shade B2, we can, for the first time, have some teeth in the surgery and say to the patient's lot, we're gonna measure your teeth and we're going to put in the sort of teeth that, that you would have in your mouth. So in some cases much larger, in some cases much smaller <coughs> than what we've got, because while the technician would order in a shade, we, he would never order in a mold. I mean, if we jumped up and down and spat our dummy out, he probably would have ordered a mould, but on a one-off basis. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't part of the normal denture process to, 
consider moulds. And as a private dentist, I do think it's an important part of making a denture, is that you choose not only the right shade, but the right mould. Um, and you can even give the patient a choice, can't you, of how much more they want to pay for their teeth. Uh, it's only like an optician asking you what frames you want, my goodness sake, I mean, it's not a big deal. So, then, you know, we're gonna to have to develop some expertise at setting up the denture, which I think for a full full will be more difficult than a uh, pass, but it's still, still doable, you know. Um, Thank you. And then, when when we've got it all uh, set up, and we're going to uh, fit, and it's all signed off and everything, then we stick it in the post, articulated on our articulator, all articulated up, and they'll duplicate the models and process it and fit it, retrofit it, and everything, adjust the bite and everything. And uh, and send it back to us as a as a as a denture, you know. So hey presto, only one visit to the lab. Now, how much we can get them down from their feet for doing every single stage, I don't know. But we're going to have to negotiate a process only fee with them, which I'm sure they've never done before. But um, you know, short of finding another technician locally, which I can't see that anyone's going to be really, you know. It's, you know, it's all very well. If you're sitting in Harley Street or Wimpole, if you're sitting in Wimpole Street and there's a technician in a basement around the corner doing this sort of work, good, you know, quality work, then fine. But not in Ramsgate, there isn't. Uh, you know, and not in East Kent, there isn't. And in fact, what I'm, in, I'm inclined to do, my long-term plan, which I'll just let you into, don't tell anyone, is that to possibly subcontract some work you know, for the, for the dentists who do want to do the decent work. I'll, um, we could advertise ourselves as having a dental lab on the site. Once we've built up the expertise. But um, obviously we won't be doing any um, NHS work, although we might do, um, we might do repairs and ads if, uh, you know, if the dentist pays us what we want, but they won't because they don't get the money back on the NHS. So they're making a loss, so they'd probably rather just send the patient to us to have a private repair or add. So after all this time, I'm going to become a denturist. And just before I get to work, I'd just like to have one final hat tip to Richard Thomas, who was the um, head of the Dental Laboratories Association at the time when all the dental laboratories uh, accepted the 2006 contract. The UDA contract, which is what decimated the profession, the, the lab profession, because it rewarded, uh, rewarded dentists for doing mouth guards instead of dentures, and uh, it rewarded them, uh, rewarded them for doing uh, one crown instead of six crowns or whatever. And so and that was the end of the, um, <clears throat> the dental lab technician industry, really, in the UK. And um, obviously he ended up on the General Dental Council. And the dental technicians ended up with another tier of inspection and testing. And a lovely fee that they pay to the General Dental Council every year for absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Other than to go towards the GDC's reserves and the wages of the lawyers who have got the whole thing captured and insist on here, you know, and on insist on striking people off when they're dead, <laughs> because everything has to be done properly. And someone might come back from Tasmania or the grave and apply to re-register at the age of 92. So, Richard. You won't, you won't be listening to this either. I don't know what you're doing now. I don't know if you're even still in the dental profession. I hope not. But if you are, I hope you have a lovely day. And I'd like to send you regards from the technician next door. Who's finally had enough and decided to pack it in. 
like so many dental technicians up and down the country. Okay, have a lovely day everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye.